afternoon. Welcome to the Wilson Center and our event examining the state of LGBTQ issues in the Indo-Pacific and its importance for the United States. My name is Abe Denmark. I'm actually here in uh, two capacities at the Wilson Center. First is director of the Asia program, um, but also as the co-chair of the Wilson Center's Diversity and Inclusion Council, uh, which is just about celebrating its uh, first year anniversary. Uh, today, uh, to discuss the issues of uh, the state of LGBTQ issues in the Indo-Pacific, we have five terrific guests. Um, we have uh, uh, Juhui Judy Han, an assistant professor at the Department of Gender Studies at UCLA. Asami Tamagawa is senior teaching professor at the Department of World Languages and Literature at Skidmore, Skidmore College. Julie Sheets uh, is chief of staff for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs at the Department of Defense. Francisco ben, ben Cosme is senior advisor to the acting assistant secretary uh, at uh, East Asian and Pacific Affairs Bureau at the Department of State. Um, and B. Kim Shao is the representative of the at the Taipei Economic and Cultural Representative Office, known as TECRO, um, um, who also worked on these issues a great deal when she was serving as a legislator in the legislative yuan. Um, we're going to be um, getting our first comments from Representative Shao. Um, after everybody's remarks, we'll have a brief uh, opportunity for Q&A. Um, if you are watching, would like to ask questions of the panelists, uh, you can do so on Twitter by using the hashtag Pride at Wilson. Um, and with that, I'll turn things over for to uh, Representative B. Kim Shao for her opening remarks. All of you, uh, happy Pride Month um, around the world. It's a great pleasure to join you all today. I'm especially grateful that the Wilson Center chose such a timely and important topic, which allows me to share with you Taiwan's experience in advancing LGBTQ rights. As you know, LGBTQ rights in Taiwan are regarded as the most progressive uh, in, in East Asia, especially after a watershed moment on May, in May 2019, when Taiwan legalized same-sex marriage. Last October, when Taiwan was still successful in keeping the COVID-19 pandemic at bay, it held the world's largest in-person pride parade of 130,000 people in the capital city, Taipei. These milestone events are colorful testament to Taiwan's democracy and human rights achievements, as well as our robust civil society. But the path to fighting for LGBTQ rights certainly wasn't easy, but I wholeheartedly believe that it's the right thing to do. And we're very proud of what Taiwan has achieved in this area. I believe it's our obligation as a democratic community to stand in solidarity with LGBTQ and all individuals in their struggle to pursue basic freedoms and dignity. And we should be committed to building the foundation for a more just and equitable world. My US education on the campus of Oberlin College way back exposed me to political discussions on rights across race, gender, class, nation of origin, and sexual orientation. So in addition to fostering my lifetime commitment to Taiwan's democratization and international participation, I also developed an interest in the pursuit of equality and respect for diversity. Therefore, I have never hesitated to advocate for those important despite challenging issues since the early days of my political career. In 2006, as a legislator, I first introduced an LGB marriage equality bill in the legislative UN of Taiwan. Unfortunately, with prejudices still deeply entrenched in our society, generating tremendous opposition at the time, the bill didn't even pass the procedure committee to have the opportunity to be discussed in the legislative yuan. In 2018, opposition to this campaign was so fierce that a recall campaign was launched against me in my constituency of Hualien, where harassment and protests at my office became a daily occurrence. So when I casted my vote along with my colleagues on May 17, 2019, 
to legalize same-sex marriage, it was a very emotional moment knowing that there had been a tremendous amount of sweat and tears behind Taiwan's LB LGBTQ movement. Now, let me briefly share with you the story of a prominent Taiwanese gay rights advocate, Qi Jiawei. Uh, you can see his photo here. Um, his lifelong dedication embodies the trajectory of Taiwan's LGBTQ movement. Mr. Chi is known for being the first person in Taiwan to come out as gay. In 1986, he came out at a press conference in a McDonald's in Taipei to advocate for gay rights, calling attention to the plight of gays, especially in light of the growing AIDS epidemic. At the time, the WHO still listed homosexuality as a mental disorder under the International Classification of Diseases. In the meantime, Taiwan was still under martial law and civil advocacy could serve as grounds for imprisonment. So Mr. Chi was subsequently arrested and detained for months for this coming out event. After his release, Mr. Chi had continued to advocate for gay rights, including the right to marriage through appeals and petitions, arguing Taiwan's existing civil code, which prohibited same-sex marriage, was in violation of the constitutional rights of equality and freedom to marry. For more than 30 years, Mr. Chi and other activists call for same-sex marriage rights have been harshly rejected again and again, but these tireless efforts were indeed not in vain. Eventually, his case was brought to our Constitutional Court, which rendered the 748th interpretation in May 2016 that the Civil Code's restriction on marriage was unconstitutional. And our legislature was given a two-year deadline to pass amendments. Mr. Chi once said that during the early days of his advocacy, people thought of him as the only gay in Taiwan because they couldn't see anyone else coming out. That was partly the case up until the early 2000s. In 2003, the first Taiwan Pride Parade was launched in Taipei City. And you can see here in the photo participants of the Pride Parade. And this is a flag, a banner held by the Tongguang Presbyterian Church group uh, that took part in this gay pride parade. It was also the first gay pride parade in any Chinese speaking countries. <clears throat> According to the parade organizer at the time, the estimated number of participants uh, when they first submitted to the city government uh, for this uh, pride parade was merely 300, but actually it attracted nearly 2000 participants. Since then, the parade has been held annually and peaked at 200,000 attendees in 2019, just right before the COVID outbreak. And you can see here on the chart that though there was a dip last year during COVID, we do expect the numbers to continue to grow. The growing numbers of the parade participants did not mean that the movement was without obstacles. While supported by President Tsai, and backed by the constitutional court ruling, marriage equality, in fact, met strong opposition from several conservative and religious groups. In 2018, marriage issues were put to a vote in the referendums alongside local elections. The proposal raised by the conservative groups, including restricting marriage under civil code to one man and one woman, as well as addressing the rights of same-sex couples outside of the civil code were both adopted. At the same time, the LGBTQ activists proposal to amend the civil code to include same-sex couples did not pass the threshold. The result of the referendum was an alarming signal that the movement still had a long way to go. But in order to meet the obligation of the constitutional court ruling and the 2018 referendum outcome at the same time, our executive Yuan came up with a draft bill to legalize same-sex marriage in February 2019. Although it was a separate bill instead of an amendment to the civil code, which the community had originally wanted, 
the draft was never let the less well received by the LGBTQ groups because it used the term marriage instead of just partnership. On May 17, 2019, a day that also coincided with the International Day Against Homophobia, the bill was put on the floor for a vote in the legislative UN. And I'm proud that I was there for that as well. Now, outside of the legislative chambers, tens of thousands of LGBTQ rights supporters gathered in the rain for this historical moment. Inside the chamber, I urged my fellow legislators to support the bill in saying that we need to shoulder responsibility on behalf of our citizens who have suffered from inadequate laws and faced discrimination. Eventually, the bill passed by 66 to 27 votes, making Taiwan the first in Asia to legalize same-sex marriage. Certainly, the passing of the law was not the end to Taiwan's LGBTQ movement. We still have much more work to do, including addressing legal barriers on marriage between Taiwanese and foreign partners, as well as perfecting the laws on adoption. Meanwhile, LGBTQ communities may still face discrimination as a result of continuing prejudices at work or in schools. However, the law did serve as a testament that no matter how difficult the path, we can always overcome the challenges by working together with love and tolerance. Just like the mother of a young boy, Ye Yongzhi, who suffered a tragic death on campus years ago due to his feminine temperament, the advocacy efforts from the mother of the Rose Boy, or that's how he's known in Taiwan, eventually led to progress in gender sensitivity in the educational systems. Here you see um, photos of same-sex couples uh, who decided to marry uh, in the uh, joint military group wedding ceremony held by the Ministry of National Defense in 2020. Here's another interesting photo that highlights some progress. Uh, that was during the rationing of limited PPEs last year at the beginning of the COVID pandemic. Our Minister of Health, Chen Shizhong, and colleagues started to wear pink face masks to demonstrate to school boys who refused to wear the pink masks that were assigned to them. And they were proving that all colors are cool. It is important to dedicate a whole of government effort to set an example in advancing education and workplace diversity and inclusiveness. Now, this is uh, Mr. Qi Jiawei, who I introduced a little earlier, um, 30 years later. But just like him, who always stands high above the crowds, waving a rainbow flag during each and every Taiwan Pride Parade every year, we will continue to march down the road until the day that no one will be subject to any discrimination or injustice in our legal system. Now, as President Biden put it rightly, everyone is entitled to dignity and equality, no matter who they are, whom they love, or how they identify. And we have strong confidence that we will get there one day, like we expect a rainbow after the storm. It may be tough, arriving at the destination, but there will always be more joining the fight for injustice along the way. And I wanna again express my appreciation to the Wilson Center and to all your colleagues for inviting me to share the experience and stories of Taiwan's progress. My best wishes to today's panel discussion to be a great success. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Representative Xiao known you for quite a long time, and I really appreciate your leadership on these issues as, as well as so many others, both uh, as a diplomat, but also as a, as a legislator. So thank you so much for joining us today. Really very much appreciate it. Um, we'll turn now to uh, Francisco Benscome, I'm sorry, Bencosme uh, from the State Department. Uh, go ahead, Francisco. Uh, thank you to the, thank you, Abe. Uh, it's good to see you again. Thank you to the Wilson Center. 
uh, and to my co-panelists for this uh, timely conversation. In my role as a senior advisor in the State Department Bureau of East Asia and the Pacific Affairs, uh, I'm privileged to devote my time at the state work, working on human rights programming and policy in the Indo-Pacific. This feels like a natural continuation of my former work at Amnesty International. And la just last week, I had the honor of briefing Congress on how our engagement strategy at state ensures that democracies deliver results to the people of the US and the Indo-Pacific. So I figured I'd spend a couple of minutes talking about the administration's policy on, L on promoting LGBT rights around the world, and then specifically how the State Department's implementing that. As, as uh, was mentioned, Secretary Blinken has made clear that the test for America and other democracies is to analyze the challenges we face and make changes to more effectively deliver for citizens, and that failing to do so only gives autocracies more rhetorical ammunition. Since day one, the Biden-Harris administration has pledged to stand with our allies and partners and pool our collective strengths to advance human rights. Democratic resilience and standing in solidarity with the LGBTQI plus people are at the forefront of this administration's agenda. Part of these efforts is promoting accountability for serious human rights violations in the region, particularly against marginalized communities like LGBTQI plus individuals. I'm sure many of you in the audience saw President Biden's presidential memorandum to advance human rights of LGBTQI plus persons back in February, an important milestone for addressing LGBTQI plus rights in US policy. His proclamation on Pride Month is also well worth the read. He spoke to those on the front lines of the equality and democracy movements around the world, often at great risk. And as was mentioned earlier, he said, we see you, we support you, and we're inspired by your courage to accept nothing less than full equality. At the State Department and within and this whole of government, we're working towards the goals that have been outlined in the presidential memorandum and in building coalitions with like-minded nations to protect LGBTQI persons abroad. Since joining state, I've been able to witness firsthand the department's broad toolkit to promote human rights. We're taking measures to ensure that our strategies, policies, and programs are informed by gender analysis and support the increased visibility and empowerment of queer women and girls, intersex persons, transgender, and other gender diverse persons and other marginalized LGBTQI plus communities. For example, the United States will continue as a founding member to lead the Global Equality Fund, a unique and effective public-private partnership and trusted resource to civil society organizations and activists. GEF, as it's known, supports emergency assistance and human rights programming for grassroots LGBTQI plus organizations to catalyze positive change. The State Department will continue and seek to expand support from these and other potential partners, including in the Asia and the Pacific. The GEF has supported the Asia Pacific Transgender Network, a transgender led organization that supports and advocates for the rights of trans and gender diverse people in Asia and the Pacific. APTN supports transgender organizations to conduct research on their communities and amplify their voices when addressing issues such as violence, health, and legal recognition. Under the GF Small Grants Program, the DRL of the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights, and Labor engages U.S. missions to nominate local LGBTQI plus organizations to lead grassroots initiatives to secure the human rights of LGBTQI plus persons. Support under this program has enabled civil society organizations across the East Asia and the Pacific to implement impactful activities, including sensitivity trainings for law enforcement, leadership development initiatives, and media training. We also regularly engage with local LGBTQI plus communities across the region to ensure that we do adopt a do no harm approach in all of our efforts, that it's tailored for each unique country context and is locally led. We applaud allies and partners that have and enforce anti-discrimination laws. We remain hopeful that public support for LGBTQI plus communities in Asia continues to increase. To amplify our work, we are partnering with like-minded partners to encourage and support joint statements, declaration, side events, reports, and resolutions in various multilateral fora to include the United Nations and regional organizations. For example, 
under the Biden-Harris administration, we have raised the importance of protecting the human rights of LGBTQI persons in U.S. ASEAN meetings and a minister's meeting with Pacific Island countries and territories. We have tailored our diplomatic approaches given the broad range of issues impacting LGBTQI communities and government positions on these issues in the region. Pride Month is, a, is an annual opportunity to elevate engagements, celebrate progress, and reflect on challenges as we engage with host countries, allies, and partners, and civil society to advance the rights of LGBTQI persons abroad. I would also like to commend Taiwan for upholding LGBTQI per, plus rights in the East Asia Pacific region. Due to Taiwan's impressive public outreach and robust civil society, there's been a marked shift in public opinion towards recognizing the dignity, equality, and human rights of LGBTQI persons. We recognize that further work is needed to secure full and equal rights for all LGBTQI persons in Taiwan and hope that these past achievements will inform meaningful advancements in the future. Change doesn't happen overnight, but from our vantage point, we can always do better. Trends, personal narrative, and research demonstrates that LGBTQI people in the Indo-Pacific continue to face stigma and continue and confront discrimination in their work and from family and friends. They often face low levels of public support, delayed legal rights, health concerns, and limited resources. In Cambodia, for example, societal discrimination and limited job opportunities continue to persist for many LGBTQI plus persons. Similarly, we remain concerned that despite advancements in recent years, the LGBTQI plus community in Vietnam continues to face discrimination, both in the public and private spheres. We continue to work with these and other partners in the regions to break down the barriers of discrimination against LGBTQI persons. To do this, we must adopt a whole of society approach, engaging with governments, private sectors, religious and community leaders, civil society, local governments, and the public. We can utilize our convening powers to bring together diverse stakeholders and facilitate conversations in safe spaces. We can empower local voices through grants, educations, professional exchanges, just like this panel. And we found that it's increasingly important to provide open and accurate information on LGBTQI plus issues in our messaging. And I'll conclude with saying that as Secretary Blinken has noted, ending hatred and violence against LGBTQI plus persons requires collaborative action from us all. And this Pride Month, we affirm our obligation to uphold the dignity of all people, dedicate ourselves to protecting the most vulnerable among us, and wave our flags of pride high. Thank you. Very good. Thank you so much, Francisco. That was uh, very much appreciated. Um, next, we'll be turning to um, my friend and former colleague uh, in the Department of Defense, Julie Sheets, uh, who is currently working as Chief of Staff for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs at the Department of Defense, sitting in a, in a conference room that I know all too well. Uh, so, Julie, uh, go ahead. Thanks, Abe, uh, and thanks to the other panelists. I think I've already learned a lot from Representative Shaz and uh, Francisco's comments on what else the Department of Defense should be thinking about. So I think, you know, we have, as much as we have a role overseas in meeting our commitments, uh, you know, under the Taiwan Relations Act or to other uh, treaty allies and partners, uh, we have a huge domestic role as well. Uh, we employ 2 million people here in the United States um, and these issues affect uh, every single one of the uh, members of the Department of Defense. Um, so I'm really pleased to be able to speak here today with you all and think through you know, how we are implementing here at home a vision of looking like and representing the country that we defend overseas um, and that we are modeling the values and the inclusivity that we, uh, under Francisco's excellent uh, summary, are proposing overseas um, with all the tools at our disposal. Um, you know, starting with what we've done here at home in the interim national security strategic guidance, President Biden uh, lays out that our competitive advantages in sort of the long term success of the United States prosperity and security are rooted in the value of our example uh, here at home. Uh, and that's absolutely what the department is doing. Uh, you know, Secretary Austin has hired uh, the first ever department coordinator for diversity. Uh, equity and inclusivity, um, and that has been really uh, powerful for focusing attention within the department on these issues and how all of us are stakeholders, not just 
folks who work in the personnel side or folks who are working on specific programs targeted to ending discrimination against marginalized communities, including the LGBTQ uh, individuals that serve with us. Last week, uh, the department held, uh, to my knowledge, the first ever department pride event. Uh, this event was held last Wednesday to mark actually the 10th anniversary of the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, Representative Shao spoke about how, you know, the adoption of marriage equality in Taiwan is, is the first of many steps that we need to take to overcome discrimination and sort of a legacy of, of bias and stereotype. And that's absolutely what our experience here in the department has been with the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Certainly there were a lot of individuals who were impacted by the policy over the years that it was in place. And the hard work continues now over the last decade and, and forward to restore and correct the service records of folks who were uh, put dishonorably discharged as a result of their gender or uh, sexual orientation, um, to uh, preserving rights for members of our military who you know, are in same-sex couples to adopt children, be able to take um, parental leave, the same as their colleagues, to be able to pass on those benefits of their medical care, of education, et cetera, to beneficiaries that are part of a same-sex couple or, you know, um, to prevent um, mental health issues associated with service members um, who are um, LGBTQ. So there's a lot more work to do, and I think uh, that's been really inspiring uh, to have that focus and attention within the department on where we're going from here. And I think that you know, it's become almost reflexive to talk in the department about how China is the pacing challenge and the United States strategic advantage is our network of allies and partners around the world and working with like-minded partners because we have so many friends. But I think one of our strategic advantages is also the fact that we have this open conversation. We have a diversity and inclusivity and a commitment to that that our adversaries cannot hope to match. And um, that's something that we bring to the world every single day through the folks that serve with us, through the representation in our leadership, uh, and through the way that we talk about what good governance, good institution building looks like, even in the security sector, where some of those biases and some of those prejudices uh, have been more uh, deeply held than elsewhere in society. Um, and I think, you know, I'll just end on saying, you know, Abe, I don't think it's an accident that you are both the head of the Asia program and the representative of the Wilson Center's DEI Council. So I think there's a unique moment right now as we look from the United States perspective, at least, at, you know, the Indo-Pacific being the region that most um, importantly impacts what America's future successes will be. And as a Department of Defense, as a U.S. government, um, we are going to be increasing over the next few decades, the proportion of our personnel who have an expertise in the Indo-Pacific, in Northeast Asia, um, in Southeast Asia and South Asia, and Pacific Islands, um, as compared to an expertise in other areas of the world, because this is where uh, the important initiatives are happening. This is where the resourcing is. And so I think those of us who work on this region, those of us who care about the United States' partnership with this region, uh, have an outsized impact actually over the next few years and therefore an outsized responsibility to really think about how the way that that growth is going to be manifest, the way those initiatives are going to be resourced is done with inclusivity, with diversity, with that sort of forefront of our values and living our values. Um, and so anyway, uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Julie. Uh, great, and thanks for your leadership in the department on these issues. Um, and I just very much uh, appreciated the uh, article that you penned in The Hill, along with uh, David Helvey, the Acting Assistant Secretary of Defense, at least he is for this week, um, on these issues. I thought it was very uh, instructive, very helpful. Um, we're going to turn in a moment to uh, Masami uh, Tamagawa, um, who put together a, a video uh, for his opening remarks. Um, but um, before we turn to that, uh, just to remind the audience, if you have questions for this panel, uh, you can submit them over Twitter using the hashtag Pride at Wilson. Um, so, uh, Tracy, if you could uh, start the video for uh, Professor Tamagawa, please. Japan still doesn't have any measures protecting LGBT individuals or couples at the national level. 
In fact, at the beginning of this month, Japan's majority party, LDP, tried to pass a draft legislation to promote understanding of LGBT called LGBT Likai Suishin Hoan. Yet it was met with fierce opposition from conservatives and it didn't pass. As many Japanese LGBTQ activists saw, the Tokyo Olympics could have been an opportunity to introduce and promote sexual equality, but it didn't. So now it might take a few more years at least for Japan to enact a law protecting LGBTQ people in Japan. I would like to explain some of the major reasons uh, for Japan's slow progress toward the sexual equality. First of all, one of the major problems facing the LGBTQ community in Japan is their low visibility. There are, in fact, very few openly LGBTQ individuals in Japan due to some different but interrelated factors. We often say that Japan is a country of conformity instead of individuality. One of the Japanese idioms, teru kui wa utareru in English, the nail that sticks out gets hammered and well exemplify the seemingly unique nature of Japanese. The majority rules most of the time. Yet there are more specific and tangible ex ex maybe somehow relates to the issue of conformity. Some study pointed out a general lack of understanding of among Japanese people. For example, instead of individuals, household or uchi is considered the basic unit of Japanese society. And public appearance or second day in Japanese has the utmost importance in Japanese culture. There are a few implications to this. First, there are two different kinds of homophobia in Japan, quiet or otonashi homophobia, and on the other hand, familial or uchi homophobia. In the public domain, Japanese people try their best not to offend anyone. So even when, even when they don't really accept sexual equality, Japanese people rarely express their homophobic thought in public. In the private domain, on the other hand, Japanese people are afraid of clearing their home or being labeled as queer hounds. So they don't want any member of their family to be identified as queer. This explains why it's so difficult to come out of the closet in Japanese society, especially to their parents. Secondly, there are some related implications concerning the division of labor by gender. Home is often, home is often seen as exclusively women's domain. In fact, it's more correct to say home as mother's domain. The most important role every Japanese woman is expected to perform and perfect at home is to raise her children. As mother, their sexuality is often not taken into account. At the same time, a Japanese mother is typically considered a solo overseer of her children including their sexuality. One of my studies on coming out in Japan found that those who came out to their parents were often met with harsh criticism, ignored or encouraged to lead a normal life anyway. Lastly, this seemingly domestic affair had some international implication as well. In the 21st century, the world has become more like a global village. My previous study on Japanese LGBT diasporas demonstrate the lives of LGBTQ expats who left Japan to live as who they really are.
shedding light on the intersectionality of gender, immigration policy, and the diverse experiences in the US, Canada, and Australia. Also, some of the preliminary findings from my current research project concerning the COVID-19 pandemic and the LGBTQ people in Japan reveal that a significant number of non-Japanese LGBTQ people from many parts of the world are in fact a, an integral part of the Japanese LGBT community. Due to the lack of legal protection, including same-sex marriage in Japan, they are suffering greatly, including their concerns over the lack of visitation rights when their, their loved ones are sick in the hospital. In this sense, I believe that if Japan doesn't resolve this quickly, Tokyo might need an international, possible UN-initiated pressure to enact a law to protect the basic human rights of not just their LGBTQ citizens, but also non-Japanese citizens as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Masami. That was uh, very interesting and very much appreciate you using the, the video uh, to make sure that you uh, got all your points across. Um, next, uh, uh, last but certainly not least uh, for uh, our presenters is going to be uh, Juhui Judy Han. Um, again, for the audience, uh, if you'd like to pose a question to the panel, you can do so on Twitter using the hashtag Pride at Wilson. Uh, so with that, I'll turn things over to Judy. All right. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you to, uh, it was actually Shioko Tamagawa who was in touch, who, who got in touch with me first and, and also um, to a Denmark for the invitation to join the panel today. Um, a lot has been said uh, already about the variety of challenges and opportunities in LGBTQ politics in Asia, and I, I would like to focus on two aspects. I, I could go on forever about this topic, and as I'm sure many of you also have much more to say. Um, and that is the legislative opportunity that exists uh, in the form of a comprehensive anti-discrimination law uh, in South Korea. Um, as well as the robust social movement landscape that features a growing coalition of minoritized and stigmatized groups, uh, and that's beyond gender and sexual minorities. Um, following Representative um, Xiao, I want to begin by highlighting and amplifying the work of the annual Seoul Culture Festival, um, however, uh, known as uh, commonly as Pride, Seoul Pride, um, that has grown exponentially over the past few years. Um, it reached an estimated 150,000 participants at its 20th celebration in 2019. Um, and I think along with Taipei, it is one of the largest pride gatherings in Asia, uh, competitive selecting dozens of rainbow clad exhibition booths from social movement groups and arts and culture producers, as well as featuring congratulatory speeches and high profile stage uh, performances that, that celebrate Pride. Just this week, uh, literally less than 24 hours ago, there was a press conference. 100,000 individuals have signed the National Assembly petition to demand immediate legislation of an anti-discrimination law in South Korea. Uh, this was no ordinary online petition. I know many of us sign online petitions every day. This was gathered through an online petition system established by the government to work as a verified mechanism to prioritize and convey matters of public interest directly to the lawmakers in the National Assembly. The process was uh, strict, uh, was so that people like me, uh, was not a South Korean national or a resident currently, uh, could not vote even if I wanted to. 100,000 individuals. The petition is now. Uh, forwarded to the Legislation and Judiciary Committee uh, within the National Assembly, and there's a formal process now. Uh, and the hope is that finally there will be discussion on the floor, and hopefully by this fall, the passage of a comprehensive anti-discrimination law. Um, a bill for this 
has already been introduced last year by National Assembly member um, Chang Hye Young uh, of the Justice Party, who in 2020 was elected as South Korea's uh, one of South Korea's youngest ever lawmakers. And among the 10 lawmakers who joined Assembly member Chang last year in introducing this bill was Kwon In Suk, a well well, well-known feminist scholar activist who has done important work to counter pervasive militarism as well as to improve the human rights within the military. Um, but to keep this in perspective, they are just two out of 10 co-authors of the bill, and that is out of 300 members of the National Assembly. It is no doubt an uphill battle. I won't go get into details of previous failures. There have been several, like in 2007, uh, in passing a comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation in Korea. But suffice it to say that the forceful opposition was led by Christian conservatives, predominantly Protestants. Uh, conservative Pro Protestant forces have been particularly unkind to minorities, sexual minorities, immigrants, and temporary migrants who often constitute religious and ethnic minorities in South Korea as well as trade unionists, dissidents, and social justice activists who compose political minorities. Uh, conservative Protestants and homophobic political leaders have even linked LGBTQ equality with terrorism and radical Islam, as can be seen in uh, recent conservative party slogans of no to homosexuality, no to Islam, and no to anti-Christianity, all in the name of national security. The current impasse uh, is not only due to these fringe or extremist uh, political actors, uh, the current liberal government elected in the wake of the candlelight protest in 2016 and 17 that impeached and removed the conservative president um, have demonstrated resistance. There's liberal resistance, uh, including from President uh, Moon Jae-in himself, a former human rights attorney who who has publicly declared his opposition to LGBTQ rights uh, during his campaign. Um, so progress seems to be stalled even after the successful transition from conservative to liberal administration. And activists does face, I think, a twofold challenge against intensifying conservative backlash, such as the highly visible <clears throat> protests mounted against uh, pride festivals and by the Protestant political uh, bloc, uh, pressuring the National Assembly, and against the liberal reluctance um, to take the step to take the to uh, to be courageous, to take that step to embrace gender and sexual sexual minority rights. Um, I want to also emphasize here the transnational connections, um, just as transnational human rights advocacy uh, networks and activist discourses have strengthened NG, transnational NGOs. Um, so has anti-gay uh, rhetoric. Um, diffused transnationally. Um, appeals for the preserv preservation of so-called uh, traditional family values or equating the AIDS epidemic with homosexuality. These are obviously echoes from fundamentalist Christian groups in the United States. Um, and there are also resonances across Asia too. Um, and activists, and I've, I've been privy to uh, limited, but I know that there are ongoing discussions between Taiwan, uh, between activists in Taiwan and South Korea um, and the success of the comprehensive anti-discrimination petition this week, I think, reflects uh, an increasing uh, social movement capacity and public support to recognize basic and fundamental human rights for, again, not only gender and sexual minorities, but migrants and ethnic minorities for disability justice that ensures safety and accessibility for all, for labor protection and occupational safety for workers who die every day, um, and for uh, demilitarization and peace um, in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, we have several recent suicides that have brought even more urgency to the need for a comprehensive anti-discrimination legislation in South Korea. Just three months ago, um, in March, uh, Kim Ki-hong, who was a co-chair of the organizing committee of the Jeju Pride, the Jeju Queer Culture Festival, committed suicide. A week later, Staff Sergeant Byun Hee a transgender South Korean soldier who was forcibly discharged from the army after gender confirmation surgery took her own life, prompting another public outcry. What has become clear uh, is that legislating against, against discrimination and advocating, ad, advocating for uh, queer and trans, transgender rights is a matter of life and death. 
Um, and LGBTQ advocacy is inseparable from a commitment to peace, anti-racism and migrant justice and disability justice, the kind of intersectional concerns that many of us in the United States have been schooled on and have been advocating for, for many years. There's increasing awareness, um, there's, there's growing uh, coalition building um, and a commitment to solidarity, both within the local landscape as well as transnational um, uh, terrain as well. Thank you. That's wonderful. I, I very much appreciate that, Professor Han. Um, we have several questions in the queue. We're not going to be able to get to all of them in the 15 minutes that we have remaining, um, but I think we can uh, tackle a few of them. Um, the first question that came in comes from uh, Michael Anderson from the Public Diplomacy Council and a retired FSO. Um, had a question for Francisco been cost me, but I think it, we can apply it to everybody on the panel. Um, he uh, mentions that uh, he reading that our embassy in Seoul uh, is flying the rainbow flag. Um, and he's asking both about what kind of public diplomacy we're doing through our embassies, um, but also how our local governments and embassy contacts um, are uh, responding to any public diplomacy efforts that we may have. Um, so, if Francisco could talk a bit about how we're engaging with uh, communities in Asia, I also think it would be helpful, uh, perhaps, if um, Professor uh, uh, Tamagawa, Professor Han could speak about how engagement with uh, the United States, with other countries on these issues, how it does or does not impact uh, the discourse within Japan and Korea um, on these issues. Um, and uh, Julie, I did have a specific question for you for you as well, um, related to your article uh, on the Hill. Uh, but we can uh, we can get to that to, uh, after we go through through this uh, this first question. So, uh, Francisco, why don't you uh, get started? Absolutely. So one of the um, the things that I, I witnessed at the beginning of uh, Pride Month was uh, a cable that went out to all of our embassies, allowing them to uh, raise the Pride flag. We also did the same thing for uh, the one year anniversary of George Floyd as well for Black Lives Matter. And um, a, a bunch of embassies throughout the Indo-Pacific uh, posted pride flags. And we really left it up to the discretion of the ambassador. Uh, sort of one of the points I made earlier was uh, that, um, you know, there's no one way to, to celebrate pride and, and sort of, um, you know, affirm LGBTQI plus rights. And so, you know, while some, uh, use the flag, others hosted events, uh, others hosted meetings with civil society partners, others increased, uh, you know, funding for um, some of the programming that we do through DRL and USAID. Um, and since we're still in Pride Month, we haven't really um, sort of done a sort of an, a, a post uh, an analysis on sort of how, uh, what response we've gotten. Um, but I think, um, you know, regardless, um, it's still, you know, espousing um, universal, but also American values uh, with respect to LGBTQI people. And, and um, you know, it's similar to how we have conversations about racism. We also um, embrace kind of uncomfortable conversations. I know, for example, I'll give one example that became, got a lot of headlines, which was in Singapore. Um, we had an event on LGBTQI uh, persons um, that generated um, a significant backlash um, in Singapore. And the response our embassy had was, um, we respect and promote LGBTQI rights everywhere um, and stood firm by that response, so. Thank you, Professor, um, uh, Professor Tamagawa. Um, I don't hear much about right uh, month uh, from uh, Japan at this moment. I believe that Japan is still in the middle of the COVID-19 pandemics. And at the same time, uh, uh, Japanese people and especially the media and the politicians are somehow like preoccupied with the Tokyo Olympics. 
if it is possible to hold uh, the Olympics at the same time uh, uh, desirability of having uh, many people from uh, all over the world. So uh, I think uh, also I heard that there are some like uh, LGBT events being held to celebrate Pride Month uh, this year, but I believe that many of the events are uh, held uh, online. Thank you, uh, Professor Han. Um, speaking of uh, uncomfortable conversations, I, I think the, the rainbow flag in Seoul certainly um, fostered uh, some uh, soul searching. Um, among progressive activists who, for instance, have bones to pick with a variety of concerns um, around the continuing U.S. military presence in South Korea, uh, whether it's about environmental destruction or uh, violence against uh, civilians, to actually online the ongoing uh, you know political campaigns around dispossession and uh, uh, construction of military infrastructure throughout South Korea. Um, so, if we're talking about coalitional spaces and if we're talking about intersectional uh, spaces, for the pride space to exist uh, and, and to include a, a variety of um, variety of political actors, many of whom actually stand opposed to, um, you know, the, the ongoing, for instance, the U.S. military presence, the flying of the, the rainbow flag simply seems like lip service seems like a cover for something else. Um, so the conversations that I've had with activists in South Korea have been uh, actually a, a really um, uh, a concerted effort to separate the government from the workers, from the, the folks who work at the embassy. And I think this was especially important during the Trump, Trump administration years um, to be able to separate and to identify and to recognize the possibility of working with uh, various, various people who work for the U.S. government, knowing that there is no monolithic or homogenous position that everyone espouses, that, that the, the government itself, the policymaking, um, and the U.S. military or the U.S. embassy, these are all sites of contention and difference like anywhere else, um, and that there must be people that we can work with um, to foster change. And I think that actually has been a, a productive um, direction for that conversation. Thank you, uh, Professor Han. For uh, Julie Sheets at, at the Office of the Secretary of Defense, actually, it's a, a two-part question I wanted to ask. First is, um, if you could speak to how the department engages uh, with our service members, um, many of whom are either mem uh, mem um, have spouses, uh, they're part of the LGBTQI community, um, they're uh, maybe traveling with children, um, who are identified in that community, um, but they're um, deployed, they're based into countries that are not as comfortable, uh, that are not as progressive on these issues. I'm curious if you could speak a bit about um, how the department navigates those dynamics, with especially with uh, allies and partners. Um, but also, I was hoping you could speak a bit more on the topic of the piece that you co-authored in The Hill about how um, building a more diverse and inclusive force is actually an advantage in our uh, competitive strategies, especially in, in, in the Indo-Pacific when it comes to China? Yeah, great questions. Um, to the first question, I'm not sure I can speak uh, too authoritatively about how we talk to service members going overseas. You know, uh, despite, uh, obviously, some tensions uh, with host countries, um, for the large part, we base U.S. service members overseas uh, in U.S.-owned and operated facilities, and we're able to preserve a bit of the life of what it's like being in the U.S. there, and that, of course, comes with uh, some tensions when, you know, the U.S. facilities on Okinawa have, you know, large uh, properties or air conditioning that is not common for the local community just outside uh, the perimeter of the facility. But, you know, part of that is also preserving U.S. education through the DODIA schools, preserving U.S. rights and benefits for those service members and their families. 
Um, and I think that you don't want to have a garrison mentality if you can't step outside the gate, but that we do whatever we can to make sure that service members going overseas that have qualified and are qualified to serve are able to do so with dignity and respect that we would afford them if they were deployed here in the US uh, to different bases. Um, I know there's a lot of cultural training that goes into folks who are stationed at uh, embassies overseas, folks who are in the foreign area officer programs. Um, and I think that comes with a little more nuanced understanding of the communities in which um, these individuals will serve. Um, obviously, I think unaccompanied tourists is probably a different issue. I think one of the you know, data points that has been most interesting to me is the uh, real need for the department to proactively look at and deal with the visibility issues for uh, LGBTQ members of the military. Um, you know, Francisco was talking about how we were able to put up flags at our embassies overseas. We very famously last year uh, passed a prescription on not uh, flying flags that are different than the US flag, or uh, in most cases, just the US flag, but in some cases, I think also the flag of the unit, uh, perhaps. But beyond that, you know, we have only one uh, kind of mission and everybody who is serving has been deemed qualified to serve and that's kind of where it stops. And the rest of it is um, about not, I think, letting people espouse viewpoints that uh, maybe are offensive to other people. And I think that we are only now just dealing with how we have maybe lumped in the pride flag or a Black Lives Matter flag as part of this sort of intent that was about not offending people that you know inadvertently signals the wrong uh, uh, sort of message there. So that's been an interesting conversation internally. And I think the other thing is that you know although transgender individuals are actually quite a small uh, percentage of the overall American community, even though it's obviously underreported, uh, it's quite a large, uh, not a large, but um, a larger, more visible minority in the armed services here in the United States, and that's for a lot of different reasons um, associated with kind of individuals that are part of that community. But I think that's why the department has been vocal about these issues and has tried to contend with um, some of the considerations affecting members of the transgender community in a more uh, forward leaning way than maybe what the public conversation or realities are understood outside of the department here in the United States. Um, so I think that's an active conversation. Um, and certainly a piece that we are dealing with in a real way here that we also try and make sure is not a complicating factor for enabling folks who want to serve to do so um, and to do so overseas, even if the local environment um, might not be a place of uh, permissiveness or, or sort of viewpoints that are accommodating. I will say on the article that my boss and I wrote, um, you know, this is part and parcel of what the United States means in terms of our presence overseas. You know, we are who we are, and we are a sort of beautiful rainbow, to excuse the, the Pride Month pun. Um, but, you know, it is sort of fascinating to me when I have lived and worked overseas and get to travel on behalf of the U.S. government, how many times the fact that we have members of our delegation who are African American, who are Asian American, who are Latino American, whatever the case may be, the fact of inclusion of these individuals as part of the delegation becomes a talking point, regardless of whether the issue of the day is to talk about you know, our alliance implementation, climate change, issues of refugees, whatever the case may be. And I think that that's so powerful that that's something that other people notice about us, right? Just because you're black doesn't mean you're not an expert on China and don't deserve to be in the room. You know, just because you're a uh, Latino and background doesn't mean you're not an Asia Pacific, Southeast Asia expert. Um, and I think that that's a really powerful example that we offer to the rest of the world that we actually are a diverse country. And it's really, really vital that the United States military and those of us who are in the civilian oversight of that military and the diplomatic corps represent the country to the fullest extent uh, possible. Thank you, Julie. Such a great point. And um, especially, uh, you know, thinking what well, you, your last point on how we just represent who we are by being in the region and being ourselves there it made me think of uh, when uh, General Vincent Brooks was commander of USFK, um, not only as an African American man, but also a vegan. 
um, as the chief commander of uh, US forces in, the, in Korea, um, I thought was uh, very much in line with that. Um, so um, I'd also note, I think, um, based on your remarks, Julie, I think it's impossible for us to have any conversation without somebody mentioning Okinawa. Um, so I just wanted to check that box. We've had way too many discussions about Okinawa over the years. Um, unfortunately, um, we're out of time for this specific event. Um, as Professor Han said, um, we could talk about this, these issues for a lot longer than the one hour that we have today. I expect we'll be doing more of this going forward. Um, but uh, on behalf of the Wilson Center, um, please uh, let me uh, again thank uh, Professor Han, Professor Tamagawa, uh, Julie Sheets, Francisco Bencosme, ben um, and B. Kim Shao uh, for participating today. A terrific event. Very much appreciate your time, your, your uh, expertise on these. Um, and uh, to the audience watching, thank you very much for tuning in. And please join us next time at the Wilson Center in the Asia program. And have a good evening.